Zach, good to meet you, buddy. Hey, you as well, Bobby. Thank you. Uh, one of my, I mean, now it's, it's, it's spread like a positive virus, but at the time, one of my good friends, Jake Owen, yeah, long time ago, was like, you know Zach Top Guy? And I was like, I know who he is. Like, I don't know a lot about him yet, but he was like, man, he's the real deal. I didn't realize you were so young. Yeah, I'm a bit of a baby, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> because, you know, your music is extremely traditional in the mm -hmm. sense of traditional compared to today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you'd have been born in the 90s, you'd have been not traditional, you'd have been current. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> Cutting edge. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yes, Jake, Jake was like, man, this guy is so good. Are you starting to feel like a bit of love from inside the industry? Like from yeah. some artists that just are like, man, we love what you're doing? Yeah, definitely. There's been a bunch that have uh, reached out and been real positive and, and really encouraging. You know, with, he was, I think, about one of the first ones, and he's been super good to me. And it, uh, it was funny. We we joked over at the at the label I'm signed with. We were like, if Jake Owens ever looking for a gig, he's he's going to run the promo team over here for Zach. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even, I mean, really, even to me, he's like, man, this guy's so good. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's been a big fan for a long time. He's been awesome, too. Which has made me go, well, let me check it out. And then, yeah. obviously, I th you wouldn't be here if I didn't think you were, you know, really good. I appreciate that. So uh, what this stage of your life, yeah, are you running all the time right now? Or is it kind of the calm before what you feel is about to be the storm? Like, wh where are you in the tired scale? A little, <laughs> a little bit of both, I guess. I, I stay pretty tired. Um, I like to say I'm, I've, I've been busier than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking contest for the last, uh, I guess since last August was our first kind of, like, it took off and it was just touring nonstop and starting to do, you know, signed with the label. So every day there wasn't a tour stop. There was a radio stop somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we're running around doing a lot of that. I feel like it's it's a little of both the, I guess, had a little break in January, and it's, you know, just picking back up into touring now. And uh, and I feel like as busy as I felt like I was uh, at the end of last year, I think it's probably just going to be about twice as much as that the rest of this year. So <laughs> it's, it's not even just the cowboy hat. It's not even just the sound of your music or the jean jacket, the denim. It, <laughs> you have the single mustache. Well, I'm telling you. <laughs> You gotta have the whole ensemble. And the thing is, I believe it. Well, because there are some that. I don't believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know for a fact. Well, I know what I feel like is a fact that they're putting on a bit. To yeah. To to, I feel like you're not putting on at all. No, I I, I don't ever try to put on too much. I already had uh, a mustache when you were nine. <laughs> and that's that, how that's how we know. No, Lord, no. I, I couldn't look at my face, Bobby. I can't grow hair on it <laughs> worth a dang. Uh, no, I. It's funny. I've been working on this thing for the last. It's probably like the last three years. I made a bunch of tries at it, and it get kind of long and wispy, and it's still too thin. I'd shave it back off, and I'd be like, dad, "No, but it." It's dad have a mustache? There. No, no. My my papa did. Uh, my mom's dad. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, he, he and I are real, like, looking at young pictures of him, I'm kind of spitting the image of him, I guess. And Is this going to be a permanent thing? Oh, yeah. It's not like, because I grew my hair out as a joke, and I cut yeah. a lot of it off today. No. But it was all a bit. But this is, yeah. this is permanent, because it should. It oh, looks... Yeah. It's it's all real deal. Yeah, I know. You don't even get your pants tailored. You just roll them up. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, yeah, these things are too dang long, and so I just rolled them up. <laughs> you from Washington? Yes, sir. State. That's where they make all the good country music, didn't you know? You know, I can't agree with that. <laughs> State, not D.C., for yes, those, for those yep, wondering. Yep. I've been to Washington a bunch of times, different parts yep. of the state. It is, It feels, at times, very isolated because yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a couple hours back. It's yep. way to the north. Yep. You know, you're up in the corner. What was, what was country music, what was music like for you within your family? Because I know you big bluegrass. Yep. Because yep. you guys all played together. Yep. Yeah, what was music for you growing up, ages, you know, 6 to 13? That was, yeah, a ton of bluegrass and, and started to... The first thing that, like, kind of made me fall in love with music, the thing I got the bug from, my folks were just huge George Strait fans. They had that playing in the house nonstop, and I thought he looked pretty cool in a cowboy hat and holding a guitar, so... why they I, like I, him? I, um, I think probably just the songs. Um, and, you know, it's it's the cool thing, you know, him being a real cowboy, actually, um was attractive my dad you know works in a livestock business still has for a long time and you know so it was kind of we were living you know we, we i would not call myself a cowboy uh, but i got to play cowboy a good bit growing up and uh and so you know we listened to music that kind of fed into that a little bit um him and marty robbins and you know that that was kind of the earliest stuff i remember just always hearing non very texas yeah i mean yeah you know, I think of Marty Robbins too. I think of obviously just El Paso. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just absolutely. But 
Washington. Did you live in a rural part of Washington that yeah. felt like a rural part of the South or Texas? Because there are parts of New York that's rural that feels like the South. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, having seen it now, uh, it's, I mean, it's it's a little different thing with, you know, the the Northwest is, I would say it's more like, like a Colorado or Wyoming mm, feel where I was good, at, yeah. I think. Um, high desert and, you know, we're the Cascade Mountains run down the middle of the state over, you know, everybody thinks of Washington and thinks Seattle and rain and over where I was at, hell, it barely rains three inches a year. It feels like out there, nothing but sagebrush and cheat grass. And, um, so it was, I, I would say it feels a lot like, you know, some of them West kind of towns more than, or, or, or parts of the world rather than South. But, well, what about school? What was, yeah. how big was your school? What was school like? What kind of student were you? Yeah, we, uh, it was a big school. Three students. I was homeschooled. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. My mom homeschooled all of us uh, kids uh, up through basically our sophomore year of high school. Was that just a trick so that they should get you to do more work around the house? Uh, there you was some have, of that. Like, if you don't there go to school, some of that, yeah. you got more stuff to do around the house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So exactly. You, you and two of your siblings were homeschooled? Yeah, well, all four of us. My, my oldest sister is just a good bit older got it. than so us, she so she was kind of, yeah, she was out. She graduated. Doing, exactly, she graduated. Top she was Academy. Doing, she was, exactly, <laughs> Top Academy. She was doing, uh, she went to community college, I guess, by the time I, you know, kind of remember doing school. But yeah, we, uh, my younger brother and then I got a, a sister, we're all 16 or 18 months apart. Um and we, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a lot of, I was a pretty good student. I was, uh, good at math. Did I, you learn on the road a lot? Cause you guys were playing music. I mean, you were what, seven when you started playing with yep. the family band? Yep. Did you, since, since you were playing a lot of music, was that really why you were homeschooled? So you guys could play music and travel? Or no, not really. The, the homeschooling thing was a big, like the, the church that we grew up in and stuff, it, real fundamental type, you know, folks. And, and that was a big thing in our church was, you know keeping, you know, protecting your kids from the world, I guess, a little bit. And uh, so we, uh, that was just kind of the culture we were all in. So what they, what they decided to do with us. And, you know, as far as learning on the road, we didn't, the way bluegrass stuff works, it's really heavy in the summer. And then there's not a ton of stuff, you know, it's a bunch of outdoor festivals and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. There's not a bunch of traveling that we did during the, you know, school year, I guess. There was, maybe three or four festivals that we'd go to during the winter. And then that was more that, you know, we'd play basketball and, and then baseball in the spring so we could do some sports as well. Um, and then pretty much the whole summer was just dedicated to, to the music thing. How did you play sports? Because it's, it, if you play basketball, yeah, they got two more players than you on the court. Oh, yeah. No. It's five, five <laughs> v three. It's hard to win. Where did you no, – how, yeah. how did you play ball? We it was all like club teams, you know, starting in little league, obviously. Like you're YMCA not type with stuff. Yeah, in Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, you, you played ball. We played basketball. Yep. Yep. What up else through play? and baseball. That was kind of it for me. And then started golfing pretty early on too. My my mom's whole side of the family's big golfers, and 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 my dad loves playing too. So that was a big one for us early on. Do you have to pass like a graduation test to when? Yeah, the way, like, the homeschool thing, the state, you still have to pa- basically just have an assessment at the end of every year. The state sends you uh, a test, basically just, you know, go over your knowledge. and, and Does see anyone look over you taking it, or can your mom take it for you? Well, she didn't, but maybe I'm she could have. I'm not saying she did. <laughs> I'm saying could other people have cheated the system? Uh, probably. I, yeah, I don't know what the verification was. Like, there was no, you know, camera on us or anything taken. What I'm it. trying to do, Zach, is figure out how I can homeschool my kids when I have them and take there their tests, go. and so I can just make them do housework. Perfect. That's, yes. I think I think you can get away I'm with it. I'm not accusing you. I'm, I'm figuring no, yeah. out a way for me to do it. <laughs> well, cameras are so much more prevalent now. I'm, I'm sure they make you, you know, sit there with your kid on the camera taking the test. And Musical instrument that you know. played first? My parents said they started me on piano first. The First memories I have is with a guitar. They got me, you know, I say that. They got me a Walmart first act guitar when I was like three or something. Like small, like manual yeah. in size? Yeah, a little, little thing. Um, and I was left-handed, and they got me a right-handed guitar, and neither of us knew the difference, so I just banged around on it upside down. But starting to take lessons, my oldest sister was a real, really good uh, classically trained pianist, and so she started teaching all us younger kids uh I don't know, it must have been four or five. I took my first guitar lesson when I was five, um, so it, it must have been somewhere right in there about the same time that I started taking piano lessons as well. Do you remember loving music as a young kid or just thinking this is what we do? Because older sister, siblings, we ju- this is just part of school. That No, it, it, was, it was definitely, uh, as far as the guitar playing side and country music, I loved that forever. 
Um, the piano lesson thing, they, my parents kind of dragged me kicking and screaming through that. And I, I hate it. I wish I'd applied myself more now. Um, but I think it was all, you know, I, I didn't have any interest in learning Beethoven and Chopin. I was, you know, I wanted to, if somebody was teaching me how to play piano like Pig Robbins, I probably would have loved it. But, <laughs> but you know, it, it was, I just wouldn't, the music didn't do anything for me. So I, I just kind of hated it. And uh, gosh, I wish I could play you know, if if I'd applied myself and be able to play piano like I can play guitar, can you play awesome. piano at all? Yeah, I can fool. I can do you a little piano man, Billy Joel. You know, a you few can little fake things. it for a couple of songs yeah. to make everybody think you're good. Yeah, like I could. I could get by that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to do. I used to do this bit at my comedy shows. I don't anymore because everybody finally had seen it. But <laughs> I well, first I took piano lessons as an adult. Yeah, which was very hard. Yeah, how old when you thirty? Thirty. Yeah, older than you. Yeah, and it was like. I was like, I want to learn to play piano because mm -hmm. I want to be because I play guitar for comedy reasons. Yeah, but I'm not a guitar player, but I play right. enough. Yeah, I was like, I'm gonna learn how to play piano, so I learned some chords just so yep. I could write some funny songs. Yeah, and I, I had a TV appearance once, and I played a song on. I actually played it on piano, yep. and it was okay, but I was really nervous, not not comfortable with piano no. at all. But then I just recorded the track, and I thought, what if I do my comedy shows and I just take a keyboard and fake it? Nobody knows the difference. Yeah, I just play the track over the top like yeah, the DJs do sometimes. Yeah, and so, but then I'd, I, it was fun. I would just sing it. But the song was pretty funny. But it wasn't. Any, yeah. It went crazy funny. But then I thought, what if I do the song, and then all of a sudden, I have somebody else record the track for me, and all of a sudden it turns into like a Beethoven Chopin, and I look like I'm up there just. Yeah, there you go. And then it's so advanced. Yeah. So then I end up like standing on one foot, just doing it like Bugs Bunny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So then everybody knew it was a joke. Right. Yeah, yeah. But but, but it makes it a bit. Yeah. But then I stopped doing uh, piano lessons because I it was yeah. extremely hard as an adult yeah. for me to wrap my head around it. Man, it's it's funny. I think about that a lot, like the fact that my parents did, you know, let me, because they didn't, my parents aren't musical at all. They they didn't have any background in it. My oldest sister basically started playing piano so she could play in church. So was she um, the leader of the band, the family band then? No, that was me. It, uh, it, really? Yeah. Okay, we'll come back to that. Keep on with the yeah. story you're telling me now. But yeah, so we, I think about that a lot. The amount of time that, like, I probably, from the ages of 5 to 15, I probably played guitar like three hours a day or something. And just the, like knowing other artists and, and people that have started, you know, in their teen years or something, I can't imagine because you just don't have time anymore to do that, you know, let alone being actually having to work full time as an adult. I remember my dad for a second was going to, um, so we had, I played guitar, obviously my little brother played mandolin, Maddie, my sister played fiddle, and then the oldest sister, Lakin, played bass for the little bluegrass family band. And so we were missing the banjo. So my dad got a wild hair that he wow. was going to be the banjo player at some point. But it was the same sort of thing where, you know, he it was probably a couple months. He he had a lesson every week. But, yeah. you know, he ain't got time to sit down and practice. And, yeah. and let alone just your, you know, you get older, it's your harder to pick chemistry, new stuff up. Yeah, yeah, it is already established yeah. how it's going to work. Absolutely. You say you were basically the leader of uh, top, yeah. top String? That yeah, was the name Top of, String, right? yeah. My mom was really proud of that one. Still is. But you're not, you weren't the oldest. no. So how do you lead if you're not the oldest sibling? I would just think naturally yeah. the oldest of the oldest would be like, I'm the leader of the band. Yeah. I, I think I think I wanted it worse than anybody else for sure. They they did it and had fun with it most of the time. I think I was pretty difficult to work with at times. <laughs> Maybe that hasn't changed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, yeah, we heck, I, I booked our first show, I guess, uh, an old family friend of ours, Randy, um, had called my dad and asked. The first show we played was opening for a Patsy Cline musical at the at the local high school, and Randy had heard that we were. He was part of the Rotary Club, you know, helping put it on or whatever. He had heard that we were taking music lessons, and you know, we kind of we didn't even weren't even doing it as a band. Everybody was just learning their instrument individually, and we were all doing our own thing. Kind of, we had nothing worked up together. And he called and asked my dad if we'd like to come do the um, come open for that musical, and. My dad said, well, Randy, you're going to have to ask them. I can't answer answer that for him. And so he put me on the phone. I don't remember this. How old but were you? Seven. <laughs> I've been told the story enough. Um, he, uh, he was like, hey, we'd like you to come do the show. And I said, well, Randy, that sounds great. We'd love to. And he's and my first question was, how long is it? Or, or how much time do we have? And he was like, oh, showing for a couple months. And I said, well, that's perfect. We'll know some songs by then, and we'd love to do it. So and then you so, start rehearsing. Yeah. Yeah, and then we started actually, yeah, trying to work up stuff together. Um, so, yeah. That was, Dang, kids do the darndest things. That, do they ever. That was you at seven. Yeah. Running the business. Yeah. Why would you play guitar for hours at a time, meaning 
Was it pure enjoyment? Was it pursuing the dream of music? Was it pursuing the idea of getting out of Washington? Not in a negative way, but just... No, right. Yeah, what, why would you dedicate so much time to it? In your mind as a kid, what did you think it would lead to? I, I really don't know that I thought it would lead to anything. All I knew was I loved the music. I, and country music specifically, I remember my folks had a... Remember them briefcase things that had a bunch of slots for tapes, yeah. cassette tapes? They had one of those down downstairs, and we still had a tape machine. Uh, I think it was pretty out of date at that point, but we had a tape machine down in the basement. And I, I would go through that thing just one by one, take one out, play it through, try and learn every song on there, learn how to sing them, learn how to play them, just sit down there in front of that tape machine for hours sitting there with my guitar. Did you want to be just a performer? Learned. I loved performing, yeah, for sure. I, I loved being on stage. I was always you know, the the front man from the start, the one talking between songs, doing most of the lead singing. My, my sister Maddie's an awesome singer as well. And, and Jorm and Lakin are too. Um, but we, the two of us did most of the lead singing. Um, and yeah, I really, it was a long time before I ever thought anything about, ah, maybe I could actually do this for a living. It just, I was ate up with the music. I loved it. It was just passion. It was just, it was just a yep. love. Yep. A whole bunch of old bluegrass records. I remember I got a, box set thing with like 80 George Jones songs on a CD. I went through all of those, learned all that stuff. I remember the first time I, they had the uh, Don't Close Your Eyes tape of Keith Whitley, and I about lost it when I heard that thing, learned every song off of it. and then It's like you're 200 inside of a yeah. body of a, well, 7-year-old, yeah. yeah. and now 25. <laughs> Do you, did you always feel a bit more mature than the kids your age when it came to the art that you enjoyed? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And I always, you know, I think I always hung out with, you know, kids that were, I played up a good bit, whether it was sports or music or anything. I was always hanging with kids that were a couple years older than me. And, um, and especially in the, in the music sense of it, I guess. I grew up with a handful of guys that I ended up playing in a band with uh, called North Country for a little while. And those, you know, they're, most of the guys in that band were 10 years older than me or something. Um, but I love They were, because yeah. I'm familiar with the band. Yeah. So, like, 2015, you guys start. What was yep. your role in that band? It was, I came in, they they had a mandolin player that got picked up by another band. How'd they band. find you? They, we just, uh, they were Washington guys, too, so all the festivals up in the Pacific Northwest, we we were going to all the same festivals, so we'd see each other nonstop, you yeah. know, just for a long time. Sure. We were just jamming, having fun. We didn't uh, think it was, but when they lost that fella, Nick Dumas, um, did most of the lead singing for them and played mandolin. They asked me if I would like to learn mandolin and come <laughs> be their lead singer. So I did. Did you learn mandolin? Yeah. Was it uh, pretty easy to go one to the other? On the one hand, yeah. It's it's weird. It's just like technical things. It's a different attack that took me a little bit to get used to. But they asked me, I guess, in like November of 2014. And I think our first show was in February of uh, 2015. Mandolin so just seems so it intense. In it's, it's, it's a just, lot. Because I would watch Ricky Skaggs. Yeah. And I know Ricky from me playing the Opry at the same. I mean, yeah. And I was a Ricky Skaggs fan yeah. as a kid. And then get, to get to know Ricky at the Opry. Yeah. But then to watch him play up close, it's just, yeah. it's so. Yeah, man. It just feels so intense up close. It is. Way, clo way more intense than it seems from afar. Yeah, and I, I think it's I think it's a more difficult instrument to play, in my opinion, than guitar. And it, probably that's partly because I've spent more time on the guitar. But, like, just from, like, physically, you got two strings, you know, the double strings tuned the same. So you're depressing you two strings sure. at a time instead of just one, you know, just little things like that. I felt like it was hard on my hands compared to, and it's tiny too, like you're wrapped around a hoe handle with your hand and, and the frets are smaller. I felt like it was kind of, I, I faked my way through it. When's but, the last time you played a mandolin? Oh, that's been a minute. Um, if I handed you one, could you fake it like you did? You can't. Yeah, oh yeah, I could play And by fake stuff. it, still play it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could make somebody feel like, just, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Man, that'd be cool. I can't I fake think anything that the, good. To the <laughs> Nothing. I can't fake I, anything. I've, I've gotten so good at faking so much yeah. stuff, I'm telling you. <laughs> when you're with those – so you're in another band. Now, at this point, it's another group. Yep. It's another group dynamic. Yep. Were the thoughts ever, hey, I think I can do this by myself, or I want to pursue something not to lose the other guys, but something that's more real true and traditional – to me, 
which is, you know, the sound we call your traditional sound now. Yeah. When did that start kind of creeping in? That was, I guess, when I started uh, working with Carson Chamberlain, uh, my producer and, and co-writer on everything. Um, <clears throat> that started to feel like, once I started working with him, he was really focused on trying to, like, that's why from the first times we talked together, he impressed upon me the importance of that to, like, all right, so we know you love Keith Whitley and you love George Jones and you love Merle Haggard and you love George Strait, but when you sing a Keith Whitley song, you got to start figuring out how to sing like Zach, not like Keith Whitley all the time. And, um, you know, or whoever it was that I was covering the song. And so there was a lot of, you know, when we would be writing and or even when I just listened to demos or whatever it was, it was a lot of working on figuring out my thing that was, you know, going to set me apart from everybody else and so at that point I think it started being like all right this needs to be my thing not as much of a the way all those bluegrass bands worked was you know it's a collaborative effort everybody's got their input on what songs they think we should be doing and how we should arrange them and you know all this different type of stuff and so once I started yeah focusing in on who I was as an artist then it all of a sudden it felt important that it's like all right, I got to call the shots now, sort of. Like um, when you were seven. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> North Country, was North Country bluegrass, though? Yeah, well, so was that was... Was it a hybrid-ish? Was a, type? Yeah, very much. Like, if you... The early Skag stuff, and, you know, even Whitley in that last, you know, thing he did with J.D. Crow, where it was it was mostly bluegrass instruments, but they had some drums on some stuff and some steel on some stuff. And piano, I think, too, in there a little bit. We loved... Everybody in that North Country band was a big fan of that kind of hybrid thing. So we were doing a bunch of country songs... We played all bluegrass instruments. It was an entirely acoustic band. Um, but we we loved, you know, bridging that gap a little bit between. Since you were the young, they were 10 years older or so, mm-hmm. generally. Was their mind, hey, we're just doing this for fun. We got jobs and kids. Mostly, yeah. I, I mean, they, they all loved the music. There was one other kid that was, he's a couple, or, yeah, a year or two younger than I am, um, who's a phenomenal musician. He's from up in... Uh, Squamish, British Columbia. Um, so we were the youngest in the band, and but the older guys, I think, definitely was more of a for fun thing. It's funny the other guy that was kind of the band leader. I started being responsible for a lot of the song selection and <clears throat> and uh, like set list or like writing. Yeah, Got set it. list and um, but this guy Will McSeveny uh, was kind of the band leader. He ran the you know as far as the business side of things and everything. He took care of all of that and did some of the co-writing on some of the songs with me too. Um, he was he's here in Nashville now. He's got a little he's got a small uh, bluegrass label. He's got a few artists signed too. So he's kind of you know I, I think really enjoys the business side of the thing probably more than the you know being the one on stage making the music. Um, so he's in the music business still, but. I think, yeah, for the rest of them, it was more of a, you know, it's a fun thing to do on the weekends. If you're in a band and, I don't know, did you sneak off and do something by yourself for the first time? Or were you just like, I'm going to go record? Or did you just like, the band's no longer, I'm going to just, like the first song you recorded was it under the, because once I snuck and worked at another radio station, didn't tell anybody. Yeah, used, yeah, yeah. Used a fake name. <laughs> I was like, let me see if I like it. Yeah. What was the first, rec- when it was just Zach Top? Or was it Zach Top? Was that your name? Yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, what was the first song you recorded, and was it when you were like, "I'm not, I'm not in the band anymore"? No, it was so after that North Country band, I joined up with another uh, group that was. I mean, they were all scattered around: fiddle player from Murfreesboro, bass player from just outside of St. Louis, uh, mandolin player, and still living player. up there. I was still living in Colorado at the time. Got yeah. it. And uh, wait, wait and you, then, I don't even know when you moved to Colorado. Oh yeah, that was uh, seventeen. We played our last show with the family band the summer of 2015. And you moved to and Colorado I was 17. Yep. for what reason? Both of my sisters were moving out there. My parents kind of shipped me off. They wanted me to get out of town. I was dating a little gal, and they thought I shouldn't have a little, little business. Taller than three uh, feet? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> She's a regular size. Okay, girl, I still regular. You know. okay, got it. Got it, got it. Just making sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they kind of were like, because I thought I was going to, Stay there and and uh, you know just get married, her and get married yeah. and yeah. go to Wazoo or something. And anyway, ended up that's WSU, I guess. Probably that's all the Washington people. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, so anyway, they kind of my sisters were going out to Colorado uh, to see you, um, and they kind of just 
ship me off with them. And Did you live in Boulder? Yep. How'd lived you like in Boulder it? for the first it was really fun while I was I was in school there for a year and had a blast uh while that went on. As soon as I decided I was done with school and quit that and started working, I got pretty tired of it pretty quick. What'd you do for work? I started working construction. Were you still playing music? Yeah. On oh, the yeah. weekends? Yep. And weekend what did you think, what did you foresee happening within the next five years or so once you decided school's not for me? Yeah. You still played music. Obviously, you loved it. Did yep. you see a future in it for you long term? Yeah. Yeah, that was the the reason that I quit school was that was like, hell, I'm, well, I guess I was only one year away from finishing. I was a, a mechanical engineer. Uh, I was only one year away from finishing my degree. Didn't even want to hang another year, huh? No, I was just like, I got to be done with yeah. this. And, and you know, it's going into debt on school. I felt like I was just digging myself a hole to where, obviously, knowing what I know now uh, on the music business side of things, it's not good to start in a hole because you're going to get yourself in more of one <laughs> trying to start this this kind of career. So, um, but the, yeah, I basically was just like, I got to make some money and save it up so I can move to Nashville. So that's why you're working. Yep. That's got why it. I decided to quit. And what My was, parents were thrilled, as you can imagine, that I decided to quit my mechanical engineering degree well, a year before I you know, finished, one so. year, I get it. I get it. I see why. <laughs> oh, I know. Like, same. <laughs> quit as a sophomore. Yeah. You know, not a junior or senior. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, you knew what you wanted to do. You're right. Yeah. And you obviously had a head on your shoulders. It was pretty good considering how old you were. And that seems to be... The, the thing that's in common throughout your whole life, if you're seven or if you're nine running the <laughs> band or if, so when you moved to Nashville, what was that number you needed to hit either financially or because you're saving up money, but what are mm-hmm. you saving to have so you can move out just enough to move, to move and have 5,000 yeah. in the bank? Like, what was it? I, I think it, more than financially, it was just like to be in a position where I, and, and you know, c- construction is just a thing. You can do that anywhere. So yeah. that was kind of, I'll save up a little money, and then I'll move to Nashville. I'm sure I can get a construction job out there. And that's what I did for the first little bit that I was out here. Um, but I think more than anything, like, I didn't know how to get to Nashville or what the hell I was going to do when I got here. I had no clue about the music business outside of just, you know, the tiny little world of bluegrass. Um, so when I started talking to Carson, that was... Carson Chamberlain. Yep, Carson yeah. Chamberlain. Uh, spring of 2018. After Daryl Singletary passed away... I put up a video of his song uh, "Spilled Whiskey," and that thing kind of blew up for me. I'd never, you know, I'd been, I'd started posting some videos just pretty much on Facebook. I guess I didn't even have a Instagram. I don't think. Um, but anyway, I was, I was posting stuff on Facebook, and I'd got, you know, fifteen hundred views on a video before or something, and that thing kind of took off um, and shot up to three hundred thousand views on it, and had a bunch of people reaching out to me. Were you living here then? Or no, just, still Colorado. Still Colorado. <clears throat> yes, sir. Um, it had a bunch of people, you know, it, it all felt like shysters uh, for, for lack sure. of a better term. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. the kind of thing where it's, you can come, come up with $20,000 yeah. and, you know, we'll cut you a record and put it out. And it was, I didn't know anything, but I, it, I knew that that didn't feel right. And I was pretty sure that wasn't the way it worked. Um, but around that same time, Carson uh, reached out to me and and we started talking and you know just seeing his resume uh and all the you know hit songs and people he's produced and all the work he's done throughout the industry um was like all right this guy's a real deal and from the you know moment we first started talking he was much more of a long-term big picture you know we're not going in and cutting next week we're probably not doing it this year and so it was it that made sense to me that it everything he was saying and telling me felt like the way to build a career, not just like let's capitalize off a little bit of online buzz. Um, was that video going a bit viral? What was the final part of the catapult that made you just go, I got it. I need to get out there. I think it, talking to Carson was was what kind of – Did he find you because of the video? Yeah. Yeah, he found okay. me. Country Rebel, if you know that page, they had reposted um, that video and uh, – and so he found it on there and starting to, you know, I spent better part of two years flying in and out of town. I'd come, you know, once a month I'd come in for a week and he'd set up co-writes for us. I'd stay at his house and, um, and all that. We did that for a little while, but that was finally, once I started working with him, that felt like, okay, now I've got something to move out there for. And cause as much as, as bad as I wanted to get out here, I, I didn't feel like there was much point in, you know, just coming out with nothing to 
I don't know. I guess it just finally validated. That's like, all right, if this guy wants to work with me, well, he really I might in have him, huh? a shot. Yeah. Big yeah, time. Like letting you stay at his house. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's treated me like another kid of his. Make you do the dishes? Well, sometimes. Okay. <laughs> See, that's how you know it's real. Yeah, absolutely. That's, <laughs> so you're moving from Colorado to Nashville. Did you just pack up the truck and drive it? Pretty much. Were you, were you more excited or nervous? or would you, What was your mindset? Like, let's just give it a shot and see what happens. If not, worst case, I go back home. Yeah, I was pumped. I was very excited. And, you know, it, it was funny. When I uh, told my parents I was quitting school and, and coming out here, like I said, they were not thrilled. <laughs> I was being facetious. Um, they, they were not fans of that. And, I, I think we all got that, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. And – so it, it was, I had a bit of a rocky relationship with them for a little bit. Really? It did create a bit yeah. of a splinter for a while. Yeah, mm. it did. And then, but I think as, you know, when I could call home and tell them I was working with this Carson Chamberlain guy and explain to them, you know, what he'd been done, been doing for the last 40 years and, and uh, you know, send home some of the songs we've been writing and that sort of thing. I think that validated it to them as well. And so I, I think they kind of jumped all on board and they were very supportive um, after a minute. So it did feel like when I moved out here, it's like, I'm going to go for it. We'll see. I've got a, you know, safety net. I can, I've got family. And, and I felt like I had Carson looking after me too, to where I, I didn't feel like I was just going to be out here on my own trying to figure out through the barren tundra of Nashville. What, what was this town do. like for you when you moved out here? Well, or at least what did it, what was your perception of Nashville the first six months? Because my definite perception was different than what it yeah. is now. It, it was dumb. I hated it because Carson told me. I figured when I'd get moved out here that I'd be playing in bars every night and writing songs every day. And he told me, absolutely not. You don't need to do that. We'll write a couple days a week and you keep working construction. And uh, I think, you know, looking back, there's a ton of wisdom in that just to keep from – getting kind of swallowed up in the Nashville machine and becoming one in the crowd. Um, I think I was able to keep the town just a little bit at arm's length and keep working on, you know, my own thing that made it stand out. Um, so it was, you know, I moved to Spring Hill. Uh, it was, you know, so I, was, I wasn't I was on Broadway every night. I didn't, I think I've been, I haven't even spent a night on Broadway. I, I didn't have much interest in that. I, I found kind of some of the more, divey places that were playing some old school music that I liked, um, stuff like the local and music city bar and grill and stuff like that. Um, but so I was still, you know, I was working construction four or five days a week and writing two days a week. And it was, <clears throat> it was work. Were you chomping at the bit a little bit though? Like I'm in Nashville. Oh, big God time. God dang, man. I want to do more. Big time. And like looking at other sort of peers of mine, uh, you know, that were, you know, they already had publishing deals or, or what have you. It felt like they're doing what I want to be doing. And uh, and I think it was – it was re even once I got my first publishing deal, um, I, I kept working construction, and it, that was all, you know, Carson kind of urging me to do that and not ever play in town pretty much. And, you know, I had a decent little road schedule still. Um, what kind of shows were you playing on the road? It was, I had a country band at that point and we were, you know, we, it just, whatever we could get into mm. some smaller time festivals, you know, play little fairs, just, you know, a lot of, some bar owner saw a Facebook video of mine and so he wants me to come play and it was a bunch of that stuff. Did that um, Facebook video, the Daryl Singletary video, did it live a long time where people were still like, dude, I just saw this video and you're like, that's four yeah. years ago. It felt like not that long, but it, it felt like for like the whole year after that, yeah. that thing kept coming back. That's up. pretty and, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was the first kind of, I kind of, I've always begrudgingly used the, all the social media stuff. And that was the first um, time where it felt like, yeah, this is a way you can reach a ton of people and you know, when I had nothing else going on, all of a sudden there's a bunch of people that know my name and, you know, are following me now. And um, I think that, yeah, it's funny. I didn't ever want to make a TikTok. I <laughs> didn't want to post on Instagram. Yeah, you're not the guy to that. me that seems like he's just craving TikTok. No. <laughs> but no. It, it, it has now it's, been seen that it, is, if you don't do it cheesy, it's not cheesy. No, exactly. Like, and, I mean, now, because yep. there was such a, I'm not going to get on TikTok because I'm not doing a dance. I'm mm -hmm, not being a mm -hmm. goon. But now it is what you make of it. 
Uh, the band yeah. that really switched that for me was like I don't know if you know Red Clay Strays. Yeah, man. I had them on my Huge show last week. I just lo- I love them. Awesome. All Ab- Alabama boys yep. and. It's kind of this awesome. mixture of like retro rock and yeah. country. Yeah, Jerry Lee Lewis thing yeah. in there. Yeah, just awesome. Yeah. So they came up to the show, and <clears throat> I was like, "When well, next time you guys are in Tennessee, come play my show." Mm-hmm. And so they did. They they showed up. We played. We did a whole thing on the air. That's killer. But I told them they were like the first band to me. Them and uh, Lake Street Drive. Yeah, Lake Street Drive. I'm Lake Street Drive. Yeah. yeah. That um they made it not cheesy. Yep. Because Absolutely. they just did what they did. Mm-hmm. Somebody just captured what they were doing. Yep. And it didn't feel like some, you know, some strings being pulled by someone trying to create yep. the content that they think will work. Yep. And those were the artists that really made me tell my other artist friends, like, shut up. Just do what you do. Just have somebody record it. Yeah. You, yeah, use it. the platform for what you Absolutely, do. Don't, it can't, don't like, uh, yeah. yeah. Don't run towards the platform. Exactly. Let the platform come to you. And if yep. it doesn't, that's okay. Yep. No, yeah, it's just if you're making compelling content – People will watch it. You don't have to be dancing or, you know, doing something funny or whatever. That was That's all I've ever posted on TikTok, pretty much. Just me sitting there with a guitar. No dances? Playing an old song. No. I th- there was one video that uh, I considered not posting. Uh, <laughs> th- there's a, <laughs> I made it while I was working on this house up north of Nashville. I, it's, I've got my tool belt on. You know, I've got my hammer loop in the back. And guys will do a trick where they toss the hammer up and, and it spin goes it loop, and it yeah. goes in the loop and so that was the closest thing i kind of came to doing a dance i guess yeah it's not close uh, to doing a dance so you're still good at my yeah. <laughs> well there was i mean i was shaking my ass around trying to trying to catch the thing you know a little bit so it was, it was i think some people enjoy can it. you dance i can two-step a little okay. i can swing dance a little this the swing dance t- my, mm-hmm. my grandma taught me a two-step i'm from arkansas so mm-hmm. yeah you know my grandma taught me to two-step yeah um, and then I also grew up in the you know nineties two thousands when yeah. music was then universally available online Napster yep. yep so you could really have any kind of music yeah. at all so I also went to a school that wasn't just all white yeah so like a two step but then I would just grind yeah I just get on a butt and grind yeah that's what, that's what we did at the Amen. dances then <laughs> and so but never really had like you know I wasn't. Super good at it. I want to dance yeah. with the stars. I won that show. But again, you did? Yeah. I didn't know you were on yeah. that. That's the mirror awesome. ball's right That's behind hilarious. you. That's hilarious. But it's it. like I never was good. Yeah. But I really, I, I, I enjoyed it fine. It was music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you, I, I, my point was I line danced a little bit. Yeah. I tried to, I never could get into that much. I, when I was out in Colorado, I had a bunch of, you know, kind of redneck buddies that I lived with, and we'd go down to the Grizzly Rose. Um, I and played there before. And like, yeah, I believe it. Yeah. That's, I love that place. We spent a lot of, lot of time in there. And I tried the line dancing thing a little bit, and it didn't. It wasn't my thing. If I didn't have a, you know, I'd like to. Have I don't a, think a I look girl under three feet a, tall. A little girl, yeah, a little yeah, gal. Yeah, a little, that's little that's what I want to be girl. dancing with. If I'm dancing by myself, I look dumb as hell. And so I spent more time on the pool tables. I guess I definitely look dumb. Yeah, but I was yeah. okay with it. But it's I love it. You know, yeah. it's like a wedding dance party, like mm. you, reception. You'll dance. Oh yeah, I'll get out. So there you're and not act too cool fool. to do it. No, no. Get Got it. a couple beers in me, and I'll start yeah, yeah. taking clothes off and doing things nobody's ever seen. So. No, I'm good not knowing about that. Yeah, that's all right. In college— There's pictures you can find. No, nope, I'm good on not seeing those, too. <laughs> uh, in college, I took line dancing. Okay. Because I knew all the girls were taking line class? dancing. It was a class? Yeah. Just well, a, at one of the clubs or something? Dude, it was Southern Arkansas. No, yeah, it was a class. It was a college class. It was a college class. Yeah, like no on Tuesday, wow. Tuesday evenings. I would go and take line wow. dancing. That's and awesome. I learned the dances because yeah, I was like, this yeah. is, but really, I just wanted to get— what got yeah. me though was I went and I was like, I'm gonna meet all these girls because apparently it's like 90% female, but it was like 90% female non traditional, so they're all like 50. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So I really, you'll have that. So I really just, that wasn't, the dances. That yeah, was, I really yeah wasn't, you just, you just became a really good dancer. Yeah. I just got a lot better at line <laughs> Didn't dancing. have no distraction. The Washington State music scene, I'm not gonna even say Seattle because yeah. Seattle to me obviously is. What it's associated with to me is two things. One, the grunge in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. All, all of course. From Nirvana. You yep. go through all. And then even a bit of a hip-hop movement. Yep. With Macklemore. Absolutely. And that, what the Washington State country scene, mm-hmm. is there a, a country scene or is there the bluegrass scene even bigger? I don't, I mean, it's hard to say. The bluegrass scene was not big out there. We have, there's a festival in Washington somewhere every weekend you can go to all summer. Um, and a, a handful of good ones in the winter as well. Um, so it felt like it was big uh, at the time. I mean, it's nothing like the Southeast. Um, 
And as far as country, there was no, like, I didn't play any country music up there. I, I was playing country songs in my bluegrass sets, but there's no, like, there's not a circuit of clubs you can play. No really. straight ahead country clubs. No, no, not really. Um, there's one, that Tractor Tavern in uh, in Seattle is a pretty strictly country spot. Um, I've not played there yet, hopefully soon. Um, but that was, you know, and even just, music to country music to see that you know it was basically when you got the county fair rodeo um they bring in some i remember the first big show i went to see was um <clears throat> john michael montgomery opened up for uh dwight yoakam i believe and i took that little gal i was dating i was she had first. grown a little by then though what's that she had grown a she had little grown by then. yeah she, she had grown pretty good yeah, yeah yeah absolutely um we were talking about <laughs> like a video going viral yeah but i saw that bad luck had really blown up on yes, TikTok. Sir. yeah and that wasn't it, that was just you. That was just you doing your thing. Yeah, it was me doing a stupid thing. I was laying on a dang seat in a pontoon. So what in my jeans, right? So what does that tell you? On what, a boat. what did you learn from that? Man, it's so funny. I don't know because it. I I don't know what it was about that video that was compelling to people because it was like you know if I listen back to it, it wasn't the best I've ever sang. It wasn't the best I've ever played guitar. It was like I was sitting in a position where it was difficult to play guitar. And I don't know if it was just because it was kind of goofy that, you know, I'm wearing jeans on a boat. Um, I look uncomfortable <laughs> while I'm playing. I, I don't know if there was something goofy about that that kind of made it resonate with people or what. But, like, I, I can point to 20 different videos on my TikTok where it's like, no, now that was a compelling performance of the song. Mm -hmm. It ain't got anywhere near the amount of views that one did. I, it feels like such a, like, it's the Wild West out there. You don't know what's going to hit her. You know, even with that song, I've loved that song ever since we wrote it, but I figured just the type of song it was, the fact that it's so different, doesn't sound like anything, uh, was, it felt to me like, eh, this is probably going to be like my sneaky favorite on the record and most other people won't pay attention to it and, Boy, was I wrong about that. Um, so it's it feels so strange to... I feel like I know a good song when I hear one and know something like that can be a hit. But even that one, I didn't call that shot, that's for sure. And I think, because I've also seen the video, it seemed... You're right. I don't even know when I'm comfortable, but it just seemed so not shiny. Yeah. Because yeah. it wasn't. No. And I think that is likable. And I think too, it's just like you just do your thing over and over again. Don't don't get don't be distraught when it doesn't work. You just mm -hmm. keep doing it because because it's not going viral doesn't mean that it's not going to connect. No. Yeah. Like it's almost like you have to keep doing it over and over again. hundred percent. Until you catch the freaking algorithm. Yep. Yep. It's wild how that stuff works. Yeah, and like even like reposting, we you know, at the beginning of my, well, I had, when we first hired my management team, hired a company to start running my socials because it was, you know, it gets to be too much for one person to run. Um, they, you know, they would even repost the same video a couple weeks later and do totally different numbers, good or bad. Right, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, just keeping on hammering yeah. that, keep throwing mud against the wall and at some point something will stick. It's the dumbest so thing. Funny. I did it a is. video the other day, just I had, my hair, I was growing it out because I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. For no other reason. Yeah. My wife wanted to kill me. Mm hmm But I put it in like five different little ponytails, which I've never done that before. Yeah. I'm not ponytail guy. No. Got a, really? Got Are a, you sure? I'm positive, yeah. <laughs> got a million st streams mm -hmm. on that video. I didn't do anything. Yeah. Except had my hair in five ponytails. And I was yeah. like, hey, I hope you guys are having a good day. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was really, yeah. it was nothing. It's, it's wild. And I think stuff. if I did it again, it may get like a thousand. Right. It's there's no telling. It's, it was a combination so of the two things. One, yeah. me being so good looking and so charming, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and those together really made that video work. Those would be the leading factors, yeah. no doubt. What does your hair look like? Uh, it's fluffy. There's a lot of it right now. Look at you. It's, yeah, there's. You have all the. You have all the hair. Oh, you yeah. have uh, like Aaron Tippin hair. Yeah, I wish I had his muscles. But yeah. Well, yeah. I saw. We can work on that. He like five years ago, pre-pandemic, he came mm -hmm. to the studio. Yeah, and he was in his sixties now. Yep. Still pretty jacked. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> Still pretty jacked. Yeah. For no a 60 doubt. year old dude. Mm -hmm. Now, that to me, like, that was the, that part of country music. I used to roof houses. And we yeah. listened to a lot of Aaron Tippin because we, like yeah. we felt like he was roofing houses with us. Yeah. He's, he was kind of the blue collar, yeah, yeah working man's 
country guy for sure. Like he's working man's PhD, right? Yeah, exactly. That's him. Man, I guess his songs just told me, yeah. and I just believed him. Yeah, exactly. But then I, I met him, and I was like, no, he was telling the truth. Yeah, exactly. That's, he, that's he wasn't really real putting him. on because he was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what's the, like, what's what's the goal for you in country music? Um, like, what would make you the happiest if you had what blank? Um, I want to write and put out songs that stand the test of time that in 50 years people are still coming back to them and being like, this is the gold standard in country music. But what if they're not successful <clears throat> now? What if they're just good, but in 50 mm -hmm. years they're still good? Mm -hmm. Would you give that up to be great for 10 and then be forgotten after? No. I I would I just the all the icons that I like emulated and and the guys that I look back to as like that was country music at its finest right there you know if it's Merle Haggard or George Jones or whatever um, you know Gary Stewart I think is a great example of somebody that didn't have a huge career for a lot of reasons you know he wouldn't know Garth Brooks or George Strait but some of those records and some of those songs that's like. That's the gold standard in country music right there. So that's and I'll your go goal. back to those time after time after time. Yeah, obviously I'd love to be selling out stadiums and, you know, do all that too. But most importantly, I think it just put out songs that people will keep coming back to and be like, that was that was as good as country music could get. April 5th, the full album comes out. Yes, sir. You went with a wild name that's totally off-brand. Yeah, you. I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, cold beer and country music. Yes, sir. Is that a track? Yeah. Okay. Yep, I thought it track. was. That was one of the yep. tracks. So yeah, that was the first single why we did put you, out to streaming. Why did you select that as your – that? because, again, you could pick – there's a lot of – I mean, we could roll through. The, you, you could have mm -hmm. been Cowboys Like Me Do. Mm -hmm. It could have been – there are a lot – Bad Luck could have been the yep. – why, why that? Or sounds like the radio. Uh, I, I mean, that's just me to a T right there. You see that title, you know what you're getting. You're getting the country music here, and you best get the cold beer out because you're going to want some as soon as you hear the first track. What about warm beer? Mm, that would be fine too, but it's less enjoyable. Mm -hmm. if, in I, a pinch. I've never drank beer, I've, so I don't know. I've drank a warm one before when there were no cold ones to be had. What about a hot beer? Like I'd hot. probably avoid. Like you like tea. Like yeah. it's boy. You ever had no, a, no, no, you ever no. had a tea? You'd beer? lose all the carbonation. That would be horrible. You just haven't done it right. Maybe not. A tea beer. A tea <laughs> Is that a beer. Thing? <laughs> I don't, I don't I've thing, never Bobby. Listen, I've never had a beer, so I can have There's all these. There's a reason ideas. they keep it all cold. I'm sure. <laughs> But I just think you could just tell people it's different and good, and they'd think it was great. Mm -hmm. We're doing hot beer. Maybe, doing, yeah, it could be a big branding thing for me. It's yeah. just the and then hot just beer and like, country mm. music guy. Yeah. So this record's gonna come out. Yes. Sir. The songs that we haven't heard yet, because by the way, you're, you're that, that, that sounds like Radio Crush. That song it was like most added or whatever. Yeah. One. Yeah. Or, yeah it was one most of the, added for three weeks straight. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Like that's all. How does that make you feel? It, it's I was blown away it felt like a, a bit of a sigh of relief it's kind of you know i knew that that song obviously sticks out like a sore thumb compared to anything else on the charts right now and uh i, I figured if it sticks out that bad it's either going to be a love it or hate it thing and so i just very thankful felt like we could okay we weren't making it up we weren't crazy this this might work um once that came out and it got that response the rest of the songs that we haven't heard yet mm -hmm. sonically what are they or the same, baby. I I said that in a Billboard interview recently, I and I didn't even think of it when I said it, but when I read the write-up after, I was like, ah, that's pretty funny. That's a pretty good line. I said, uh, for those of you that like it, that's great. You're going to get a whole bunch more of the same. If you don't, you're not getting anything different. So <laughs> it's it's more country music as, as good as I can manage to make it. Do you still listen to any... Uh, any bluegrass that's being made, like current current bluegrass? Not much. Um, that's same sort of thing. I, I feel like uh, if I go listen to some bluegrass, it's usually older school stuff, mm -hmm. Larry Sparks or, you know, that old J.D. Crow in the New South stuff. I love bluegrass album band stuff. That's where it was at for me. Lonesome River Band, that was the stuff that made me fall in love with it that I wanted to emulate and play. You know, Dirks. Obviously, you're going to do some oh, yeah. with Dirks. Yes, sir. Like that dude. Yeah. He'll bluegrass you all day. Yes, sir. And legitimately. Yep. Like, it's not an act. He's I mean, he went and did a bluegrass record. Yeah, and exactly. And spent a bunch of time and money and mm -hmm. energy. And yep. just because of he, he loved to do it. I mean, I was it. talking to Dolly, 
and she was talking about bluegrass. She said she had to get rich before she could do something that she wanted to do when she was poor, yeah. which was make a bluegrass record. <laughs> yeah. I think Ricky Skaggs had a line about that too, something about, yeah, I went and made some money in country music so I could afford to keep making yeah. bluegrass music. <laughs> well, man, congratulations. <laughs> Thank it's, you. It's really cool that. because, I mean, so many, just so many of the folks around here that I like kind of vouched for what you were doing. Sure. Because, I mean, there are 10,000 things coming in all of us every single day. Yeah, absolutely. You know, with you, people, with me. And so I don't get around to everything. I'd like yeah. to, and I make a note. Go, look. But and there were two or three people that were like, Zach Toff's awesome. Like, he's I like the neck. That. And so I was like, well, let me see. And I'd listen, and I liked it. But then I was like, let me see if this dude's putting on or not. <laughs> because, like, you know. Yeah. The, oh, absolutely. You look like you could, could be, be cosplaying a cowboy. 100%. But it's really you. Yeah, yeah. The mustache is not only real, it's as off. I mean, <laughs> if you didn't have a mustache, I would go like, you need a mustache. Yeah, yeah. It, it, feel, it feels like it completes the picture. But you're just like a kid. <laughs> yeah, and my mustache looks like a kid's uh, mustache. No, no, it's good. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's definitely solid. Appreciate well, it. man, I, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan now. And thank you so much. I'm rooting for you. I, I like anybody that. who, it doesn't matter what style you're doing. It doesn't have to be in country music. It can be mm -hmm. whatever. I like anybody who doesn't really change because the temperature says so yep and it can be a bit difficult to be doing it one way when everybody says hey maybe you should just modify slightly yeah and i just don't feel like you've done that and i feel like mm -hmm. that's the strongest thing about you and that's what's gonna really propel you I the same that. way you talk about your songs like you're gonna love it you're gonna hate it you know with you that's all that's where, that's where you want everything right because mm -hmm. you can't get any traction if you're just pretty good nobody cares yeah yeah somewhere in the middle doesn't yeah do it doesn't do you good. any at all yeah. yep. and so like I just think you're going to kill it because you're the, you're the real deal as far as what you present. Thank you, man. And, that's, and if you that. don't like it, you're still the real deal. Yeah. But you don't worry about them. Yep. There are enough people that love what you do. Yeah. Well, really cool, man. I, this has been super fun for me. Uh, you guys can follow Zach at Zach underscore top on Instagram and then yes, right. Zach top on TikTok. Mm -hmm. But you got more TikTok followers than Instagram followers. Yes, I do. Yeah, TikTok's been good to me. It's so funny. Isn't I, that weird? I never wanted that you it. Yeah. are the one that TikTok's been good yeah. to. Yeah, it's, it is goofy. It's ironic. To denim me. on denim. That's right. Jeans rolled up, mustache right. wearing, <laughs> Aaron Tippin hat having. Yeah. The, well, he didn't have a hat. The hair. No, hair, hair. Yeah, hair. Yeah, hair. Yeah, he didn't wear a hat. <laughs> um, uh, sounds like the radio, which is now. But this podcast will live on in perpetuity. So whatever yeah. you're putting out. Everybody check it out. Zach Top. Mike, anything you want to say to Zach here? It inspired me to grow a mustache. I've been trying for like 20 years. Come on now. Hey, don't stop believing. <laughs> I have a hope now. Don't stop believing. <laughs> All right, it. Zach, good to see you, buddy. Thank you, Bobby.